Donald, and good evening, everybody. Well, after a long summer of division of Cabinet colleagues contradicting each other about Brexit and the direction the country was going to go in, I was one of those people saying that unless the Prime Minister gets a grip on her Cabinet and on the Brexit process, I thought she might be gone by Christmas. And last week, she said, right, OK, I'm going to give a big defining speech on Brexit and where we're going. I'm going to reassert my leadership. She didn't say it, but that was the implication. And I'll do it on the 22nd of September by giving a major speech in Florence. Her first really big public speech on Brexit since Lancaster House way back at the start of this year. So we were all waiting to see, could she get a grip? Could she get control of all of this? Now, just to be helpful, the blonde bombshell, Boris Johnson, decided he would somewhat preempt the Prime Minister, and the Foreign Secretary wrote a 4,000-word piece that appeared in Saturday's Daily Telegraph. It was a beautifully written piece. It was in the form of a speech. I mean, it sort of included lines like, I stand before you. Um, and Boris defended all the things that he and all the other Leave campaigners had fought for in the referendum. He said for us to stay inside the single market or the customs union or both would make a mockery of the referendum result. He was bullish, positive and upbeat about what the UK is going to achieve once it's free of the shackles of Brussels. He also reheated the 350 million a week, defending it absolutely and saying that most of that money could go to the National Health Service. Well, it was, as a, as a lever, I was pleased to see it, because I wonder where they'd all gone, because we've been hearing this narrative about transitional arrangements and maybe we'll pay an extra 30 billion quid at the end of Article 50, and I was thinking, what's happened to everybody in the Cabinet who was there on the Leave campaign? Have they given up? So I was pleased politically from the Brexit cause that Boris said what he said, but I thought to myself, well... When I was leader of UKIP, if I had said that I was going to make a major speech next Friday setting out the future of the party and my deputy or someone in that sort of position had decided to usurp me with their division, with, with their position a week before, I think I'd have gone absolutely bonkers. The, the Cabinet um, have not responded particularly well to Boris's intervention. And here was Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, speaking on The Andrew Marsh Show yesterday morning. What we've got is Theresa May managing that process. She's driving the car off to continue the allegory mm. and I'm going to make sure that as far as I'm concerned and the rest of the cabinet are concerned, we help her do that. This is a difficult moment. So this, this is backseat driving in Yeah, effect. you could sort it for backseat driving, absolutely. So, Amber Rudd says Boris is trying to be a backseat driver, but Theresa May, who was in Canada today, talking about the UK-Canada trade deal after we leave. Theresa May responded to her Foreign Secretary thus. The UK government is driven from the front and we all have the same destination in our sights and that is getting a good deal for Brexit uh, with the uh, European Union. That's a good trade deal but also a good ongoing relationship in relation to other matters like security. So, slapped down, it would seem, by the Prime Minister for speaking out of turn and attempting, I think, to usurp her. Boris, who spent most of the weekend in absolute silence in Perda, um, has been interviewed today, a big pulled interview with a variety of media organisations, and this is Boris's defence of his article. As for backseat driving, honestly, uh, there's one driver in this car to use uh, Amber's metaphor, which he's quite, you know, all, all often using, and quite rightly. Uh, it's, it's Teresa. Uh, what I'm trying to do uh, in, and I you know, look at the piece, what I'm trying to do is uh, sketch out what I think is the incredibly exciting landscape of the destination ahead. Front seat drivers, back seat drivers, are they all driving you mad? Um, I've never heard so many <laughs> references to driving. Um, so what's going on here? Um, is the Prime Minister really in control? Uh, from your perspective, who do you think 
is driving Brexit. Tell me what you think. Is it Mrs May? Is she still in the driving seat? If you think so, call me on 0345 6060 973. Or maybe you think, actually, Boris now has stolen the march. He's sitting in the driving seat. He's not going to move. He's going to get support. Party conference, of course, coming up very soon. Another reason why Boris's intervention was so helpful. Maybe you think it's Boris. Text me on 84850. Or maybe, as I say, you think we're being driven mad by all of them. In which case, tweet using the hashtag Farage and LBC at LBC. And as ever, you can watch us on Facebook and comment there. And we're live here from London. And, and perhaps to explain it all to us, perhaps Neil in Welling completely has read what's going on. Neil, who's in charge? Hello, Nigel. Um, first of all, we know each other. Um, I'm the shaven-headed gentleman that's uh, popped up from time to time. Oh, I remember you, yes. You. The last time I saw you was at Margate. I remember, I remember, Neil. Very good to have you on the show. And I know that, uh, well, like me, and the reason we've known each other 25 years yeah. is that you're a dedicated um, Eurosceptic lever. Um, what's going on? Well, uh, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I suspect that Boris is increasingly worried about the possibility of the backsliding here, I think. Um, invisible pressure from the CBI, perhaps the TUC, big business, getting to the cabinet, get, and perhaps from the back benches, you know, perhaps Theresa May is going to go cold. I'm particularly worried about the possibility of an undefined transition period. I'm very suspicious about that. And where so am I. Lead. So am I. So I am I. I was right to speak out. I'm glad he did. I know he's come under the pressure for it, but uh, like yourself, we need a man of steel, as you have been for so many years. Well, that's very sweet of you to do. I mean, it does, it does seem to me that the transition period is the Article 50 period. That is the two-year transition period. And I'm, I'm, Neil, I'm with you. This idea that they're going to extend it for a further three years and maybe pay another 30 billion quid in and for us not to be able to do our own trade deals. And then perhaps at the end of the three years, Neil, say, oh, well, you know what? Um, why not just make it for another parliament? I mean, I agree with you. But given you've got Boris now setting out his position, given that you've got the Chancellor and the Home Secretary who clearly, uh, you know, want this transitional period, want things to continue as normal. And here's Theresa May with a major speech coming up on the Friday of this week. Who, Neil, in your opinion, is in the driving seat? Well, I think right at the minute, you know, you have to keep the faith. Um, it's still relatively early days, and um, I think Theresa May still is. OK. Um, I'm just wondering if she'll stay the course. You see, there's, there's one interesting scenario that's in my mind, if I may quickly say. If at the end of this, this two-year negotiation period they, they say... OK, we're going to have another referendum, as Vince Cable wants, a Lib Dems one. <laughs> and they stitch it up. They could say, look, do you approve of Brexit, um, a soft Brexit, so to speak, staying in the single market, customs union, European Court of Justice? If you say yes, then we leave, but we don't leave, because in effect, in practice, we haven't left anything. If you say no, they can take that to mean that you don't approve of Brexit and cancel the whole project. That's well, what worries me. Well, no, it worries me too, but Neil from Welling, thank you very much for your call and catching up, uh, catching up with me again. And Neil thinks that Theresa May is still in the driving seat, but only just. Sadly, Mrs May has dithered and has now decided only to take advice from Hammond and Rudd. Heaven help us, is what I get on Twitter. Tiss from barrow upon saw good evening. Good evening, Nigel. How are you? I'm, well, I'm, I'm very well, um, and I'm rather like the previous caller. I'm pleased that Boris wrote what he did. I, I, I'd rather he hadn't reheated the £350 million a week. That strikes me as being really causing a huge diversion. But on the rest of it, I thought Boris wrote a beautiful piece and the fact that he didn't talk about transitional arrangements. Uh, yeah, I mean, frankly, I cheered. But quite what it means for the government, Tiss, is another thing. Who do you think's in charge? Well, uh, if, if I'm perfectly honest, I don't think that there is anybody necessarily taking control and, and driving the agenda. I mean, one of the reasons we voted for Brexit was to take back control. Is this one of these so new Google... Dri we... Is it one of these new Google driverless cars, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about it is, you know, um, uh, uh, Theresa May kept saying, oh, Brexit means Brexit, and, and unfortunately, it seems that at the moment she doesn't really understand what Brexit means, and, and she doesn't seem to be providing much direction herself. I mean, when you've got the uh, the Chancellor and the, you know, uh, and, and the, the International Trade Secretary is having a big spot over the entire summer which, through which she remained silent. 
it, it really says that there's not much leadership at the helm. And I think what, what's really going on, potentially, Nigel, is, is there's a massive infighting in the Tory party. Yeah, absolutely. Between, between Brexiters and, and, uh, and between Remainers. And what, what they try to cover over, what, what Boris Johnson is, is, is burst wide open again, is the fact that it's not a settled issue. Uh, there is quite clearly divisions in the cabinet. And I'm really, really glad that he actually spoke up. I was beginning to get disappointed myself. So was I. So was I. That he hadn't said anything. So what, what do you think that, Nigel, is is actually going to happen in, in, in the immediate term? Do you think that it's going to precipitate a leadership election or... Well, I think, uh, firstly, I totally agree with you. I wonder what on earth had happened to all of them. You know, the Pretty yeah. Patels and the Michael Goves and the Borises, they all appear to have gone to ground and allowed, yeah. allowed this pro-transitional period, pro-normality argument to be made. Um, and yeah. I really worry whether they'd lost their nerve. So from that perspective, I'm with you. What do I think is going to happen? Well, uh, do you know what? I think we're going to find out after Friday. I think the Prime Minister is actually in deeper trouble than anyone realises. And I think Boris's intervention, whilst good for the Eurosceptic debate and cause, uh, I think has, has highlighted, brought to the surface, those massive divisions that exist within. So, Tiss, to me, the jury's out, but thank you for your call. Jonathan in Finchley. Um, Tiss thinks it's a driverless car. What do you think? Uh, let's continue the motoring metaphor, Nigel. Right, go on. Boris, Boris is not only in a, in a Boris is not in the back seat. He's driving a different vehicle. Right. And the and the wheels are coming off both vehicles. Uh, let's step back. Uh, Boris has an eye to the main chance. He always has had. Look at what he did during the referendum campaign. He thought that uh, he was going to come out uh, smelling of roses and was going to prime minister. And Michael Gove. Uh, scotch that. Mm -hmm. uh, Boris is doing exactly the same thing. He makes a speech and then, of course, he says, no, no, uh, I'm not a backseat driver. Theresa's in charge. Don't believe a word of it. Boris, ahead of the conference, has an eye to the main charge. But, Nigel, the main point is that uh, Britain is now at crunch point in the negotiations. Uh -huh. it, is, it is facing the EU27. It has impossible demands of the EU27. And the wheels are coming off both vehicles, as we always knew they would. And this is going to end in tears and hopefully it will end in uh, the, unfortunately, the economy is going to go south because of the uncertainty. The cabinet is going to divide. We're going to see resignations. And it may well end with uh, an acknowledgement that uh, Article uh, 50, triggering Article 50, was a mistake. And we will have a second referendum. Oh, people, will, people, people will see the chaos, Nigel, and we will remain in the European Union. I Don't think forget. you haven't got a cat chance in hell of that, Jonathan, after Mr Juncker's speech last week. But, but, I do take the point that you've got two different vehicles driving here, and perhaps the wheels are coming off both. Perhaps the car is headed for a great big crash. I don't know. I thank you for calling. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.15. Boris has blown apart the cabinet splits, and you can see, can't you, on one side, you've got Hammond, and you've got Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, on the other. You've got Boris, Michael Gove, and the Prime Minister, who to date has gone on saying that Brexit means Brexit, but has appeared to be gradually, I would say, over time, supporting the softer position. What is the softer position? Well, look, I repeat the point I made before the break. Mr Juncker last week saying that he wants the European Union to have one powerful president, a finance minister who intervenes in nation-state economies, for everyone to join the euro, a full European army, air force and navy by 2025, and I could go on. The chances of this country voting to stay in or rejoin that European Union, well, after my friend Mr Juncker has said what he said, I'd put pretty close to zero. But... But and maybe you think I'm wrong. Maybe there are some of you out there who think, actually, we'd love now to embrace the United States of Europe. I don't see it. But what, what I've thought from day one is there was a possibility that our political class in Westminster, who didn't ever really want this referendum, and, and many of whom uh, found the result pretty abhorrent to their thoughts and their way of life... I've always thought there was a possibility they'd take us down a road where we finish up a bit like Norway, stuck inside something like the European economic area, still having to obey uh, EU rules, um, and finding it very difficult to be free 
to make our own relationships with the rest of the world. Oh, and yes, paying a lot of money for that privilege. That was my worry, and that, I think, is now the debate. You know, clearly, Philip Hammond wants us to be in a Norwegian-type position. Boris very clearly stated in the Telegraph on Saturday that Brexit really should mean Brexit, and that means we crack on, we leave, we don't stay part of a single market, the customs union, or anything else. Uh, and Theresa May is in the middle of all of this, but has clearly over the summer, I think, been softening towards a more EEA, Norway-type position. So who is driving this car? And I've heard people tell me that it's driverless, it's it's headed for a crash. Something Theresa May is still in charge. Stephen on Facebook says, I think that Hammond may be in charge. Steve, te Steve says, Theresa is driving Brexiteers up the wall with her timid approach. Well done, Boris. Your boss needed a reminder of her remit. Well, she probably did need a reminder of her remit. But to do it just a few days before a pre-announced big speech, I don't think was all that helpful. So who's in control? Who is driving this car? Ricky and Croydon, I know, has the answer. Hi there, Nigel. Uh, Hello. As a, uh, as a 23-year-old uh, Londoner, uh, I'd like to say thank you for everything you've done for us. And I'm sorry about all the abuse that uh, my fellow... 20 year olds have given you i think it's disgusting but um just just yeah on the on the subject of it i think that um the, uh, the uh, columnist Pete, peter hitchens um the newspaper writer has yeah. got it absolutely right uh, the problem is with the conservative party is that they're actually two different parties in one uh, yeah. you've got your anna subri your ken clark your theresa major philip hammond nicky morgan uh who who are just all they are now is upper class uh, left-wing uh, snobs that uh, are proper conservatives anymore. I've never found uh, Ken. I've never found Ken Clark snobbish. I have to say, Ricky. But anyway, go on, go on. <laughs> and the problem, yeah, as I said, Nigel, the problem is is that uh, we have two two different political parties in, in one at the moment. And um, at the moment, uh, you know, I, I could never vote conservative due to, due to the uh, Ken Clark and the Anna Subis. I, I wouldn't be able to trust them on it. But back back to Boris Johnson. Yeah. Um, I think I think he's saying the right things uh, for Brexiteers. The only problem is, is I, I think he's saying it for the wrong reasons. I think he's saying it for his own gain. Uh, but however, I do think that he is saying the right things. I just think it's the wrong person saying it. Do you, I mean, do you think Ricky that he believes in it? Uh, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I, I, only only he will know that inside his uh, his uh, his mind. But. Um, it, he is saying the right things, but I don't know if it's for the right reason. Well, 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 he is saying the right things, Ricky. And what's going to be really interesting is not only do we have Theresa May's speech coming up, but in a couple of weeks' time, we've got the Tory party conference. The faithful will gather in Manchester. And my guess, Ricky, my guess is that Boris will be even more popular with the grassroots Conservatives because of a stance he's taken on this, because the vast majority of them are very, very strong Brexiteers. So the question Absolutely. is, question is, Ricky, I think right now, I think Theresa May is probably in the driving seat. Can she stay there? Um, I, I think at the Tory party conference, I think as she normally does, she'll say all the right things uh, then, but... Uh, she she'll backslide when it comes to the actual the actual uh, time. Um, I don't think she's in control of her own party at the moment. In fact, no. I don't think anyone in the Tory party no. can be because it's so divided at the yeah, moment, no, no. and it will be divided until until it splits up into two different parties. That's well, you may be right. You, you may be right. And do you see any candidate that could perhaps bring these two wings together, or is, or is that frankly impossible? Um, I, I'm definitely in a minority of my age, <laughs> but. Uh, the only the only way I would vote for um, uh, the Conservative Party mm. is if uh, Jacob Rees Rees Mogg took over as leader. <laughs> well, you never know, Ricky from Croydon. Thank you very much for your view. And Ricky, there saying, look, actually, the truth of it is, they're two different parties. They're completely split on this issue. And do you know what, Ricky's right. They have been split on this since about 1972. I would say that fault line has always been there. And no shortage of opinions coming in. They're obviously clueless. All of them, I get. Boris is better for the lead role because of his business sense and his experience as mayor of London. The prime minister may needs an Aston Martin instead of a bus full of Euro fanatics, suggests Richard. Nigel, more like being led by the nose up the garden path, says Philip. So a whole 
range of opinions. No one's driving Brexit. It's a shambles due to the driver not passing the test. <laughs> That's quite good, Claudia. I like that. <laughs> you could say in many ways she didn't really pass the test, did she? Uh, the election has made things a lot more uncertain. Anthony in Staines, good evening to you. Good evening, Nigel. So it is a very split Conservative Party on this. I don't think anyone would disagree with that for a moment. Is anybody actually in driving it? Is anybody in charge? Well, yes, it's called Theresa May. OK. Uh, because remember, she has achieved some remarkable milestones so far in Brexit. Uh, she passed the article, uh, she triggered Article 50. Yeah, it took her nine to months to do that, Anthony. Nine months. A full gestation. Well, she did it. Because don't forget the majority of Tory MPs, not members, MPs are pro, pro-EU. Yep, sure. So she, she's done remarkably well and she passed the Brexit bill. Yep. So she's got two steps. And I think that people think she's soft. I don't think she is. I think she's quite hard and quite dry. OK. Look at her voting record in the shoe. And but I think it, she will surprise people. But isn't it all a bit hesitant, Anthony? Well, it's bound to be hesitant, isn't it? It's a big step to take. And the economy is the overarching thing. It's the most important thing of all. And May's Trump card is the economy is doing rather well. Mm-hmm. So everybody thought it would fall apart after the, uh, the vote last year, the referendum vote. And it didn't. She steered it in what is, a, uh, I think, a very good call. Right. We've got investment coming in. All right, Anthony, you make the point that she triggered Article 50, she's passed the Brexit bill, there may be critics like me that say it's been a bit too slow and hesitant, but as you say, this is real big stuff, and you think she'll stay in that driving seat, Anthony, yeah? I do, and I think Boris has, uh, what can I I say, he's imploded. Uh, He'll stay there, but he's once again shot himself in the mouth with this. Okay, okay, Anthony, you've made your point very, very clear. I wonder what Daniel in Enfield thinks. Is Theresa May secure in the driving seat, Daniel? Oh, hello, Nigel. Um, I've got another metaphor for you. Oh, um, oh not another one, please. Yeah, what now? Yeah. What now? <laughs> it's metaphor heavy. This show. Um, <laughs> it's a rudderless shit. Oh, no. Unfortunately, I think. Oh, come on, stick to cars, like please. I mean, no. Surely right. a car with a steering column is not working properly, or all right, it's a rudderless oh, ship, Daniel. Okay, okay. I, I'll give it you. It's a rudderless ship. So, what happens now then? No, because I was going to say because the, the EU seem to have laid it out. They've they've said what they want from this, but we're not actually... It's almost like it's the Three Stooges, you know? Or, or, or what I said to your, uh, uh, your telephone operator, um, I, I believe that it's almost like they're um, uh, a stroppy teenager that's being told to go up and tidy up their room, and they go <laughs> upstairs, they throw a few toys around, and then they run off in a strop. Can you imagine and Boris I, tidying a room? It's, it's beyond me. I, I, I really tidy, can't fathom yeah, that one. Let alone tidy a room. <laughs> <laughs> So, Someone so, needs to buy him a comb. I don't know. <laughs> Do his but tie up, a variety of things. But Daniel, yeah, okay, they, maybe they are stroppy teenagers, and maybe it's almost like my gang doesn't like your gang. But the point is that we need to have some leadership. It, who, who can take control of well, the I'm driving seat? To him. You, you wanted this, so why are you not? Oh, this you know, isn't this isn't proactive. about Brexit, Daniel. This is about the Conservative Party at the moment looking rather inept in terms of dealing yeah. with the process. If I was in charge of the renegotiations, they'd probably all be finished by now. But I, I, I believe, honestly, <laughs> I, I feel like it's because it's the political class and they don't really want it. We have a woman who's a leader who differs and new turns all over the place. Yeah. You know, she can't make her mind up. Yeah. And ultimately, she was never a leader in the first place. So she's begrudgingly doing it. And and, and she's someone that sort of, she, she talks a good game, but she's all talk and no leather trousers, I feel. Well, so she kind of... So, da- know, so she, Daniel, the car is driverless, yeah? Well, no, the boat is rudderless. All right, <laughs> OK. Daniel from Enfield, I thank you. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.30. So, Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary, does not want Boris Johnson to be a backseat driver. This after he lays out in a 4,000-word piece in the Telegraph on Saturday his vision for Brexit, preempting the Prime Minister, whose big speech on Brexit comes in Florence this Friday. She, of course, insists that she's the driver and she's in charge and she knows the destination. Uh, and Boris today saying, well, I really don't want to be a backseat driver. Um, but, of course, not saying 
that perhaps the one thing Boris wants more than anything else is to be the driver at the front of the car with a new position and a new rank of Prime Minister. It's possible. Meanwhile, um, another car that really rather broke down at the time of the general election um, and has been in sort of care and maintenance ever since and has been struggling and spluttering and attempting to get back to life um, has a vintage leader in the shape of Sir Vince Cable. And Sir Vince Cable, yesterday being interviewed on Sky News, said that he was a plausible candidate to be the next Prime Minister. And today, he said the Lib Dems need to start winning again, promising bold and radical policies. He said his party was totally united over Brexit. I think what he meant was against Brexit, but they united about Brexit. Common sense moderation, he said, was a virtue at a time of political extremes. He says there is some big thinking going on in terms of the future of tuition fees and vocational education. Surprised, surprised as I was that Boris reheated the 350 million a week, I'm amazed that a Lib Dem leader talks about tuition fees. And I think the great belief that Vince has, and indeed as Tim Farron as leader had before, is that by being a party that is completely against Brexit, that wants a second referendum, that wants us to stay in the European Union, is somehow electorally going to catapult them to the top. And it didn't happen in the last election where the Lib Dems only got 7%. And, got to tell you, Vince, I'm not so sure it's going to happen now. I'm really, really not so sure it's going to happen now. But, but, the biggest, most expensive motor car on the road is, of course, that owned by the Conservatives. Of course, the fat cats always have big cars, some will say. And I wonder, Burkan in Sidcup, I mean, who's driving this? Is, it, is there any sense of control here? Or is it a complete shambles? It reminds me of a, a Tesla car on autopilot. No right. one's at the wheel at the minute. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, mean, I, I, I can quite see that. And in fact, actually, a majority of callers so far have suggested that it is a driverless car. So you feel the same way, do you? I do. I mean, the last bill she passed was a bill literally just copied all the EU laws. It yeah, reminded well. me when I was in secondary school and I decided to copy my best friend's homework. I mean, she has no, no leadership. She has no clue what she's doing. She has no drive. She has no ambition in Brexit. And this is why I'm, this is why I'm really fed up with the right wing papers. They made her out to be the queen of Brexit. Well, that's right. Uh, Burkan, for me, I mean, somebody who'd been an ardent Remainer all of her life, uh, who, in my view, had totally failed as Home Secretary, totally failed to deal with non-EU immigration, the bit that we were actually in control of, to suddenly see the Daily Mail saying, this is the woman that will deliver Brexit. This is the new Thatcher, the new Bodicea. I mean, I couldn't believe it. Nigel, she couldn't even deliver a pizza. <laughs> that one up. Last time I watched, the, I watched the Paxman interview and he asked her there, he said, is Brexit the right decision? Four to, times. Uh, four, four times. Four yep. She four. couldn't even answer. Yeah, he said four and times. He said to her, as somebody who voted Remain, do you now believe in Brexit? And she said, we will carry out the will of the people. She's, carrying, she's doing nothing for no one but the interest of her own party. And I think that's the problem with the Conservatives. They called the referendum for the interest of their own party, and they are running this country to the ground. And the problem is, I've always said to myself, Keir Starmer was the main man for Brexit. David Davis is doing a terrible job. And but, I think, but Keir Starmer doesn't want Brexit, does he? He wants it wrapped up. He wants it wrapped up in a series. He says, oh, of course we respect the referendum result, but we've now decided that we're going to stay inside the single market and the customs union for the transition period and perhaps for longer and maybe, who knows, forever. Well, I always said to you, I rang up before, I always said to you, I'll stay in the single market for five, seven years, let the country settle. And then when we do have the deals, when we do have the trades in them seven years or five years, then we leave the... But, but Burkhan, but Burkhan, 
Birkin, we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to do that. See, this is what they're doing to us. The EU are trying to keep us trapped inside this single market, and that's what they want to do. They've got allies like Keir Starmer in this country who feel the same way. And at the same time, are telling us, oh, no, don't go and negotiate trade deals with anybody else. You're not allowed to do that. You know, we can't be stitched up by these people both ways. And that's why, when you're in a tight corner, you need real leadership. You need somebody in charge of the wheel, who clearly has the confidence of all of the passengers. And we certainly haven't got that. Burkan from Sig Cup, I thank you very much for your call. He feels like it, he feels it's like a, a Tesla not being driven by anybody. Maria says on Facebook, Nigel, May is always stalling the car, like nine months worth. Derek says, is anybody actually driving? Barry says, has May even worked out how to get in the car? And these, these, these car metaphors continue. My next caller is Michael from Manchester. Who's in charge, Michael? Nobody. Nobody. Okay. Right. Nobody. But no one ever is. The idea that, that someone is in control of government, there's one person, it, it, it's just not realistic. Well, OK, fine. I mean, there are a whole range of departments in government, of course, I understand that. I mean, that's why we have a cabinet, for goodness sake. But on this key issue of Brexit, and let's not forget, May made it, or attempted to make it, the centrepiece of the Conservative election campaign and said it was the reason for calling the election. So, more specifically, who is in charge of the Brexit process and the direction of it? Theoretically, come on, that's David Davis. Theoretically, right? He is supposed to be the one who is doing all the research and he's supposed to be the one who is making, making the play. And let's face it, when you actually listen to the summaries that we are given each time they, they do that in Europe, what happens is, is that, w that David Davis talks about this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to do, and the European Union just spend its time saying no, 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 no. That's, that's actually what's going on. So we, I was quite impressed in the summer by the way that we clearly were leading the way with it. We were actually saying, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this. And all they're talking about is the money, which is obvious. Well, yeah, well, Michael, I mean, what David Davis did uh, during August was to produce a whole series of policy position papers on a big range of issues. And I was actually, Michael, pretty complimentary about David yeah. Davis at the last set of negotiations. I said at least he was behaving like a grown-up and saying, look, you know, we can't give you the keys to our house until, and, until we first agreed the price for it. And, and I, I, you know, I have been complimentary in some ways yep. about David Davis. My concern, Michael, about David Davis through this whole process, and it could be through cabinet pressure, is that he appears to be too willing to go down the transitional period route. And I, I really don't think we voted for that. The, the way he talks about the transitional period is, is that each individual sector of the uh, uh, of our uh, economy each different one will have a different transition that actually makes a kind of sense the trouble is is actually suspect that people like people in, in in europe what they are looking to do is to frustrate the whole process and and do what they did to norway which is is to i mean this is some, the sort of thing that's been said on this program several times yeah the aim is to get us into that uh, middle area where we are where we have the worst of all saying, worlds <laughs> exactly yeah. exactly yeah. where where i mean the, the european economy is sliding downwards i mean what we are paying this enormous amount of money in order to have a deficit with them, to have our industry made inefficient by endless, ridiculous regulation. Oh, no, 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 Michael, I mean, that, that's why we've... I mean, look, that's why we voted to leave. And actually, to, to be fair, the European economy is bouncing a bit at the moment. But, Michael, is... OK, we've talked about David Davis and his approach. If Theresa May is unable to impress this week in Florence and at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester, if she's an, unable to do that, who do you think, or is there anybody that could take over the controls of this car and keep these two warring wings together? That, that's a really difficult one. I actually suspect that none of them want to do that. And the problem is, is you're, I mean, you are right. She has shown herself not to be able to, to read the political landscape well. And that's why she called that election. 
the, the, all the warning signs were evidently there. I didn't see them. I don't know if you saw them. She certainly didn't see them. But that, that's the, the sign of a statesperson, to use the politically correct term. The sign of a statesperson is that you see states. Is, yeah, and, and you make the big call and you get it right. And she got it wrong. She got it wrong. wrong. Then, fifteen years after you're dead, you're still not a statesman. Mm. And I, I think that's I think that's where sh- she's gone wrong. But the reality of it is, you're right. It's cabinet government, but also we've got the BBC uh, briefing against Brexit, and of course now briefing against anybody who's pro Brexit, such, oh, yes. such as Bo- Boris. Sky is the same. They do the same with Donald Trump. When you actually look at what these people are really doing and you ignore BBC and Sky and CNN, what you, what you see is these people are actually doing things that are working. Well, and but, Michael, but, Michael, the media are apart. The country's crying out for strong leadership, and that's why the opinion polls have shifted from 52% who voted Brexit to now 70% who want the government to get on with it. Michael, I thank you for your call. Um, and a very positive, uplifting text. Boris has shown more leadership in his Telegraph piece than anyone in government since the referendum. On Brexit, he has inspired where Theresa has allowed us to sink into gloom and despondency. That's what Michael thinks. Right now, you're listening to The Nigel Farage Show, exclusively on LBC. It's 7.46. The cabinet battle for who is in control of the Brexit car and the government car is really somewhat out of control today, with Amber Rudd saying she doesn't want Boris as a backseat driver, Theresa May insisting that she is in charge, and many of you thinking that actually no one's in charge at all. And in other driving news today, Wayne Rooney uh, has been found guilty of drink driving and has been asked to perform 100 hours of community service. So there you are. If you're not in control of the vehicle, things can go very badly wrong. I'm going to ask Frank in Chelmsford. Chelmsford, who's in control of this car, Frank? Is it the Europhiles? Is it is it those that want to leave? Or is the Prime Minister actually in not too bad a position, really? Nobody, nobody at the moment, Nigel. I, want, I tell you, I want in the driving seat. I want Amber Rudd. Do you? I'm watching, yes, I do. I've been watching Amber Rudd for some time on PMQ, and and yesterday on the Am, Am, Amber Andrew Marr show. Yes, I thought she came over so so strong and articulate. She did not duck a single question. Didn't answer them all. Was a little evasive. <laughs> you can't have it both ways, Frank, on that, can you? I mean, come no, on, no, no, really. no, no, no. <laughs> All right, so... Because, because, you know, Andrew Moore, he does ask questions in a certain way. And some, some of the questions she couldn't answer. But she so cool, so cool. He didn't come back at her twice and three times. He, he, he could... Because of what she answered. But Amber Rudd... I would like to see... Frank, I would like to see, uh, uh, Frank, on, Frank right? I, I, I want to put this to you. Yes. If Amber Rudd takes control... And is yes. and is driving the Conservative Party car, right? Yes. Given that she wants us to stay in the single market, yes. she wants us to stay in the, basically in the customs union. She wants a transitional period. She wants us to finish up in a position that will be much closer to Norway than what people voted for in that referendum. And she was an ardent Remainer. If you put someone like that at the wheel of this car at the next set of traffic lights half half the half the party will simply get out and walk away what you're saying then is that you're in favor of boris well my, this is my i favorite. didn't say that don't put words in my mouth i think boris i think I'm boris wrote i, I think boris frank that. wrote a good article but i'm not sure that he's right to be the driver absolutely i mean this is my record on boris yeah when he was the mayor yeah cycle through the highway the garden bridge the airport in the tent you the taxi Come on, Nigel. Oh, what? Frank, 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 don't put words in my mouth. I'm Listen, I haven't given my answer yet as to what I think, uh, as, as, as to who is in control, uh, but I think, Frank, I think, all right, listen, you're an Amber Rudd fan, and I agree with you in one way. She comes across well on television. She came across well in some of the debates during the referendum. She certainly comes across as being authoritative, and I do agree with that, but I think her position, Frank, would put her at odds with just too much of the grassroots Conservative Party. That's my feeling. Frank in Chelmsford thinks Amber Rudd should be in control. Hammond has been quiet for months, and I suspect that he's in the driving seat. I'm not expecting a rousing speech in Florence, a la Thatcher, because May will not want to upset anyone, says JP in Cornwall. I would suspect, JP, uh, that if we get a non-rousing 
speech uh, that simply attempts uh, to placate people inside the Conservative Party, that would be a disaster for her. I think she's got to quite decisively come down on one side of the argument or another. You know, earlier on this year, it was all Brexit means Brexit. Over the course of, course of the summer, she appears to be moving towards transitional arrangements. And I'm told here by BJ, you keep running Theresa May down, but you never say who should take over. You seem determined to discredit the Tories when they are the only party that can deliver Brexit. Um, well, I'm listen, I'm not determined to discredit the Tories. They're doing a very good job of that themselves. They don't need me. Just look at how they are with most of our callers saying the car at the moment is driverless. I wonder what Mervyn in both thinks. Who's in control, Mervyn? Nigel, can I first congratulate on get you getting us to the referendum? Well, well done. Thank you. <laughs> now, um, I think, I'm hoping that um, they're in cahoots that the May and um, Boris are actually helping each other ramp up the out movement, which will be a very good thing. Uh, if we were to stay in the customs union and the single current, that means we're still in the EU. Why, how we escaped being forced to vote again is a miracle. And you've got idiots like uh, Clegg and Cable trying to get us back in there. They're total maniacs who won't leave it alone. Well, that's certainly true. Um, so you think it's a clever plot that somehow Boris and Theresa are on the same side? I sincerely I really hope so. Do you know something, and, Mervyn? Uh, the EU asking us for a rebate is rubbish because we've, we've funded huge buildings. Oh, all sure. Oh, sure. But that's a separate issue. I honestly, you know, if I've... And I know I'm under pressure as leader, leader and prime minister. I know I'm under pressure. I've had Lord Phil Harris of Carpet Fortune, Tory party donor and supporter for 50 years, has come out and lambasted me as leader, said I'm blooming useless. And I can't, you know, I can't give any sense of direction. And I've said, look, this is awful. I've got elements of the cabinet all summer generally contradicting each other. So I've decided, right, OK, Florence, the 22nd, of September 2017, I'm going to take back control. And then, without reference to me, without talking to me, without warning me, without briefing me, my foreign secretary writes a 4,000-word piece of a Daily Telegraph the weekend before. Mervyn, this isn't teamwork, is it? No, no that you get, there's, hopefully there's a bit of conspiracy there, Nigel. But the wow. other thing is, with all, all the people who are against this movement and the, the EU trying to keep us in, I have been on LBC many times, I haven't had the pleasure of speaking to you before, but the thing is, I've always said, all these people who keep saying we part stay in this, part stay in that, that means we're still in. And this business about a, a, a trial period or a oh, yeah. period... Uh, well, that's, that we don't need it. No, need no, it. and that was the great thing about Boris's article, is he did not talk about a transition deal. Mervyn no. from Beau, thank you very, very much. First time caller to this programme. Whoever's driving the car, it's only got two gears, neutral and reverse, says Hilton from St Albans. And my last caller this evening is Simon from Barnes. Good evening. Good evening, Nigel. How are you? I'm well. So is the Prime Minister Good. at the wheel and firmly in control? Um, she happens to be there at the moment. I think what we're looking at is, um, and by the way, there'll be no analogies <laughs> with regards to driving. Oh, go on. <laughs> I do that for a living. Well, if you want one, I mean, how about the difference being uh, a great leader, like, for instance, maybe a London cabbie, or compared to Theresa May at the moment, looking like an Uber driver and being lost. Right, OK, um, very good, well done. Well, <laughs> I, I, I was into that. They're very way. good. So, um, come on, who's in charge, Simon? They're all jockeying for position, yep. and they're all jockeying for position because this is a sign of weakness. This is a sign of weakness because of the general election. There was nothing wrong with her calling an election. You could call an election six weeks after winning an election if you're going to win. Mm. Um, the problem is with her two half-witted uh, people in the background who were uh, giving her advice, which was quite clearly the most awful advice. Uh, one has ever seen yep. with regards to property rights, etc., yep. etc. Et can she, can that. she, Simon, we're running out of time. Can she, do you think she's got it within her to wrestle back proper control? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Right, so it's going to be somebody else. Simon from Barnes, my last caller of the evening, thank you very much indeed. And my final thought on this is actually, Theresa May is still in the driving seat. The difficulty is, the car is running out of fuel.
it, it, it really can't reach the destination unless something radical and important happens. And I think there are two major events that will determine whether she stays in control of that wheel. The first is the speech in Florence. She needs to impress. The second is the Tory party conference. The knives are out for her. She needs to get back control very, very firmly and put some more diesel in it. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show here on LBC. I'm back tomorrow evening from 7. Coming up at 10, it's Ian Collins. But someone who is always in control of the car is, of oh, course, yes. Clive Book. Well, I think the wheels may have fallen.